the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, looking at verses 40 down to verse 42. And let's stand once again for the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. It says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, as we now come to your precious and holy word, we ask your blessing, your blessing on this time. I pray, Spirit of the living God, that you would guide us into all truth. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive what it is that you want to speak to our hearts today. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what you are saying. Give us a heart that is open and a mind that is receptive, God. Lord... Let the seed go forth and let it find good soil to be planted in, that it may bear fruit in our lives. Holy Spirit, anoint this time, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning I want to preach to you on four pillars of the church. Four pillars of the church. And we come back to a very familiar day, the day of Pentecost. And it was on this day that we see here in the book of Acts chapter 2 that was, it is considered the birth of the church. It is the beginning of a new dispensation. It is the beginning of a new epoch in the history of the world. We see here the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all Flesh. The promise of the Father was poured out on the disciples and on all of those who will believe. And we read that on this day, his disciples, the disciples are the apostles of Jesus, and a number of about 120 are in an upper room in Jerusalem, and God the Holy Spirit is poured out. And we know what happens. They begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it happened to be on the day of Pentecost, which was a feast of the Jews. And so Jerusalem would have been crowded with people that would have traveled there to celebrate this feast. And so these disciples, these 120, begin to speak in other tongues and the people that are there hear them in their own language. They hear them speaking the wonderful things of God. And what took place when this happened was that Peter stood up in the midst of all that was going on. Some of the people began to say, these people are drunk. This, these people are out of their mind. And Peter stands up and preaches to them, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he proclaims to them that this is the fulfillment of God's promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then he preaches to them, Jesus. He begins to declare to the crowd, Jesus Christ, that you took him, you crucified him, but God raised him up from the dead and he was preaching to them and we read that his preaching was not in word only, that it wasn't just words, but it was with power and deep conviction. And so the crowd hears Peter preaching and what do they do after he is done? It says that they cried out, they were cut to the heart and they said what must we do to be saved and Peter says to them in verse 38 repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. He tells the crowd, he tells them listening, after they ask what must we do, he tells them to repent and be baptized. Place your faith in Jesus Christ and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is not just for this generation, but it's for every generation that will come. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And we read that day. It says in verse 41, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. And that day 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 new believers. Amen? 3,000 people in that day came to faith in Jesus and were baptized. I, I imagine that was a long day, a lot of people going down into water and coming up out of water. Amen. Amen? They were added, and then we see in verse 42, a pattern is given to us. What did this infant church do? This was the, the beginning of the church. This was when the church began. This was the church at its purest. At the very beginning, what did the church do? What did they look like? And I, I want to emphasize this again. I want to say this again. The church is not a man-made institution. It is not a man-ordained or organization. The church is the body of Christ. It is made up of everybody that is born again. It is made up of everybody that is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is a divine institution in this planet. It, on this earth. It is His body. Amen. It is not a social club. We do not gather because we have similar interests. We are the dwelling place of God. The Word of God says that we are living stones and we are being built together for a spiritual house which is the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That is what the church is. The word for church in the Greek is ekklesia, and it literally means those who are called out. It is a calling out and an assembly. Those who are called out and those who assemble. And that is what we are. We read that from the, our study of the book of Revelation that Christ is walking in the midst of His church. Christ is walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. He is still walking in the midst of His church, using His church and speaking to His church. He is in control of His church. We see here in verse 42 these four pillars. Let's look at this together. He says in verse 42... At the beginning it says, and they continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly, or that they devoted themselves. We see here that what took place on the day of Pentecost, that, that what took place when these 3,000 people got saved was not just somebody repeating a prayer and then going back and living how they used to live. It wasn't somebody coming to an altar and saying uh, some words, repeating a prayer, and then going back out and doing what they used to do and never coming back to the house of God, never going to church ever again. And I want you to understand one evidence of true salvation and true conversion is that they continue in the faith. Amen? God does not have stillborn children. Amen. God does not have people that come to be born and then die immediately. That's not how this works. Amen. 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 They were born again. And what was the evidence of it? What was the evidence that they had been transformed? It says here, they continued steadfastly. Amen, amen. You want to know a mark, a mark of true conversion is listen to this. You don't have to chase somebody down to get them to go to church, amen. You don't have to chase somebody down to get them to read the Word. You don't have to chase somebody down to get them to have an appetite for spiritual things. Once the Spirit comes in, you have an appetite. Amen. Amen. We see here it says they continued steadfastly. 
And what was it? We see here the first pillar that they continued in. Number one was the apostles' doctrine. They devoted themselves, number one, to the apostles' doctrine, to the apostles' teaching. These men, these 12 apostles, were eyewitnesses to Jesus, to his ministry, to his death, and to his resurrection, and they proclaimed his word. And we read that the crowds were devoted to the teaching of these holy men, that they were devoted to what they had to say, and they, they were listening to them preach and listening to them teach. And I want you to understand today, listen, we have the full canon of God's word. We have the 20 seven books of the New Testament. We have the 39 books of the Old Testament. The canon is closed, meaning there will never be anything added to this Bible. There will never be anything else. And so you and I as God's people, we have to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. You know what the Apostles' Doctrine is? The 27 books of the New Testament. That is what the Apostles' Doctrine is. This is the Apostles' Apostles' doctrine. This right here is the Apostles' doctrine. You see here, they continued in it. They kept going. You see here a pillar of the church is a continuing in the Word of God. It is the Word of God that we teach and that we believe and that we obey. We continue in it, being devoted to it because it is God's Word. God's Word nourishes us. It strengthens us. It corrects us. It convicts us. It renews us. It is milk to us. It is bread to us. It is meat to us. It is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. It is more precious than gold and silver. It is what God has given to us to renew our mind, to strengthen our faith, to encourage us and build us up and make us mature disciples of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And you and I, as our overseer Tim Hill would say over and over again, we are only as spiritual as we are scriptural. Amen. Amen. We are only as spiritual as we are scriptural. And they devoted themselves to God's Word. And you see this pattern all throughout the book of Acts. You see the preaching of the apostles. They proclaimed the gospel so much so that that story that you read about of Paul preaching so long into the night that Eutychus, the man dwell, sitting in the window, what did he end up doing? Fell asleep and fell down dead. He continued, it said, Paul continued his sermon till the early hours of the morning. And, and be thankful, I'm not going to do that today. But you see here, they devoted themselves. They continued stead fastly in the apostles' doctrine. Amen? Amen. Yeah, they had experienced the Holy Spirit. They had gone down into the water. They were made new creatures in Christ. But they had to keep going. And they devoted themselves. And this is what Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. What did he tell him? He charged him. He gave him a command, preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. That is when it's received and when it's not received. When it's in style, when it's not in style. Preach the word. Preach the word. He said there's going to come a time when people will turn away from the word and be given over. They will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. They will not endure sound doctrine. But what do we do? We keep preaching the word. Amen? Because you are God's people. You realize that? You're His. You're God's people. And what do you need more than anything? You need His Word. You need His Word. What feeds you? What strengthens you? What builds you up? What makes you go on to maturity? What makes you more and more into the image of Christ? It's His Word. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Secondly, we see the second pillar of the church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, secondly, and in fellowship. 
fellowship. They continued in fellowship. It's the Greek word kononia, and it literally means a participation and community. They were together. They participated in the lives of one another. And this is a pillar of the church. This is a pillar of the church. John Wesley said there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. There is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. You realize the church of the living God, God has ordained it, God has called it, and God has made it that we live in community with other believers. And this is how God designed it to be. It was His design, and we understand that we need one another. Man, oh man, more than ever over this past year, can I say that with absolute assurance, we need each other. Amen? We need each other. We read in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God has put us together to bear each other's burdens to come alongside of each other and help one another in our time of need. Do you realize that God designed that? That's God's design. That's what God intended. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 and Romans 12. Romans 12 and verse 4. It says... For we as many members, for as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. In verse 9 he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor. Giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You see here we're one body, but we're different members, right? Not all of us has the same function. Not all of us has the same gifting. Not all of us is called to the same thing, but we are called to be one body. And you bring this gift, you bring this gift, you bring that gift, you bring this, and we come together as his people. That is how God designed it to be. Amen. Amen. The church needs your personality. You ever think about that? The church needs you. Amen? It needs your gifts. We need each other. One of the clearest verses and one of the most simple verses is found in the book of Hebrews. Turn with me there. Hebrews 10. And we know this verse. Hebrews 10. And verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another in, in order to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, to spur each other on. The book of Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. 
we consider one another in order to stir each other up to love and good works. And then he says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Not forsaking, not abandoning. And in fact, when he's writing this, it says that there were, there were those that were doing it, as is the manner of some. But I want you to understand this is a God-ordained thing that we fellowship. That we be around each other. Amen? That we see each other. That we stir each other up. How many have ever gone through something... And God used a brother and a sister to stir you up. How many have ever been having a day where you feel down and somebody has called you or texted you or done something, a brother or a sister that has encouraged you? How many have ever been in a low point in life and God used it? Does, it's not always that God uses the minister. It's your brother or your sister that is next to you in the pew that many times God uses to strengthen each other. Amen. Amen. We read, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. They continued in fellowship. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. This is what Paul says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. He tells them there, he says, let us not sleep. Verse 6, he's not talking about not sleeping at night. He's not talking about not going to bed. You should, get, you should go to bed. You should get sleep. You should get rest. He's talking about spiritual sleep. He's talking about falling asleep spiritually. Getting, dozing off when it comes to the things of God. He says, don't fall asleep. Watch. Be alert. Be awake. And I think about that. Do you realize today that God has put us together in order to help us stay awake? Amen. You ever thought about that? That God has put us next to each other to keep us alert, to keep us awake. You ever, you ever go on a long journey... You ever been in a car ride and you got your co-pilot next to you and you start to get sleepy and so what do you ask him to do or what's one of the most important things that you can do as a co-pilot in a car on a long trip? Talk to the person driving, right? It keeps them awake. It keeps them alert. Keeps, it keeps them focused on the road. You, you talk to them, right? You keep them awake or you slap them or you do something to keep them from dozing off. Amen. You see truck drivers that wear those headpieces and they're, they're always talking to somebody. They're always on the phone with somebody. They're always conversing with somebody to keep them alert, to keep them awake, to make the day go by. And that's how God has designed it. Oh, how awesome is it when we can talk to each other and stir each other up in regards to the things of God. Amen. Amen. And God has designed us for fellowship. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. And thirdly, we see here the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. The Lord's Supper. Now this also included the eating of meals together. But it would have been more... More importantly, that they were observing the Lord's Supper as Christ commanded the church. They partook of communion regularly. It was a, an ordinance that Christ had ordained for his body. It was a sacrament that he put in place. And this was something that they did. They continued doing it. You see, when we 
partake of this sacrament, what are we doing? We're going back to the cross. We're going back to the sacrifice. We're, we're going back to Calvary. We're going back in our hearts and our minds where Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We're remembering the price that he paid. We're remembering the body that was broken. We're remembering the precious blood that was shed for us. It takes us to the cross. And we as God's people must live under the shadow of Calvary's tree. Why? Because nothing humbles your heart more than when you continually go back to the cross and you continually go back to what Jesus did for you. Does that not root out unforgiveness in your heart? Does that not root out bitterness in your heart? Does that not root out worldliness and all of those things when you keep going back to the cross and being reminded of what he did and reminded of the price that he paid they went back to the cross the breaking of bread and we as God's people we live under the shadow of the cross being reminded of the price that he paid and the love of God for us and then lastly we see they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Prayers. We see this church in its infancy and purity, devoted and continued to prayer. You read the book of Acts, you see a spiritual, spiritually vital and vibrant church. You see a powerful church. You see a living and vibrant church that prayed. In Acts chapter 1, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were praying. They were praying. They continued for a 10-day period waiting on the Holy Spirit to be poured out. We see in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John made their way to the temple at what time? At the hour of prayer. And what were they going to do? They were going to pray when they met the lame man. In Acts chapter 4, when they were arrested and they were put on trial and commanded not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus, when they were released, what did they do when the church came back together? They prayed. They prayed. They went to the Lord in prayer. In Acts chapter 6, we see that there was a problem that arose in the church because some of the Greek-speaking Jews, the widows, the Hellenists, were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the disciples, it says that they appointed seven deacons that would take care or handle this business because they needed to devote themselves to two things, prayer and the ministry of the Word. They realized that the success of this church, the success of the ministry that Christ has called us to, it, we have to be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. We read in Acts chapter 10 that Peter around noon went on top of the house of Simon the, the tanner that he was with and he was praying when the Lord gave him that vision. We read in Acts chapter 12, we read that when Peter was arrested and put in prison that the church made constant prayer for Peter and the Lord set him three, uh, free. In Acts chapter 13 we read that Paul and Barnabas and other prophets were at Antioch and they were fasting and ministering unto the Lord and the Holy Spirit said separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have called them to and we read that they laid hands upon them and prayed and sent them forth the church was sent forth by prayer in Acts chapter 16 Paul and Silas prayed at midnight they devoted themselves to prayer to prayer Colossians 4 and 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Ephesians 6 and verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Jesus told the parable that men would always pray and not give up. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek or seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And this is what you see in this early church. You see these four pillars 
pillars, the Word of God being proclaimed, fellowship with each other, living life together, stirring each other up, encouraging one another. You see, remembering the cross, going back to Calvary, and you see a church that was a praying, praying church. We see these four pillars. And I would say, Lord, touch your church this morning. Touch us. Been blessed over the last week to be studying that church at Philadelphia. We preached on it this Wednesday. Was the church of the open door? Was the church that Jesus said, I have set before you an open door and no one, no one can shut it? And he was going to use that church. And he even said, you, even, you have a little strength, you have a little power. Meaning that the church was small. It was an insignificant church in that city of Philadelphia. But they were faithful. But they were faithful. They continued in his word and did not deny his name. And God was going to use them. And I say, Lord, use Praise Chapel. Amen? Use this church. Let us disciple people in this church, even though... Even though we may be insignificant, even though we may be small, open a door, God. Amen. Open up a door. Let there be no void in this church where God's Spirit is not ministering to some age group or some people group in this church. Amen. Use us, God. Use us, Lord. Open up a door. You see, as this church was doing this things, these things, you read verse 47. As they continued, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The church grew. And who was it that added to the church? The Lord. The Lord added to the church. Amen. Lord, and I would say, make us a vibrant church on fire for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Is that your prayer this morning? Is that your desire? Let's stand together. Praise you, Lord. Holy Spirit. Praise you, Lord.
the same. He's here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. Praise you. He His name again. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He this morning. Let's be like this Book of Acts church devoted to God's Word. Devoted to each other. Devoted and going back to the cross. Remembering Christ and devoted to prayer. Let's do that. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as your people. Help us, God, to be devoted to your word. God, I I pray for the body of Christ and this church for a renewed hunger and a renewed love for the word of God renewed passion for it. I pray, God, that as your people commit to your word, that you would give revelation, that you would illuminate your word, and that you would transform your people through your word, God, that faith would be built up and strength, God. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we devote ourselves to fellowship, we devote ourselves to each other. I pray, God, that we would be used of you to stir each other up, to encourage one another to bear each other's burdens, God, to be a blessing and a strength and a, and a source of accountability to our brothers and our sisters, God. Lord, use us, we pray. Lord, I pray if there be any bitterness, if there be any unforgiveness, God, if there be any unresolved conflict or any anger, Lord, that you would remove it, Lord, that as you taught us to pray, Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive all those who have sinned against us, God. Help us to love one another. Help us, God. And Lord, I pray that we would live at Calvary, that we would be constantly reminded of the precious blood that was shed for us, that you died for us, God. And Lord, help us to be a people of prayer. As your disciples came to you in Luke 11 and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, let us be a people of prayer. Let us be a praying church. Lord, I ask that you would pour out the spirit of grace and supplication upon your church today, that we would intercede, that we would stir ourselves up to seek you and to stand in the gap on behalf of those that you've placed us around, God. Help us, we pray today. We worship you and we bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands and we'll pray this morning and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And now I pray, go with your people today. Bless your body. Bless this church, Lord. Strengthen and edify. Lord, let us be built up together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.